thank you for joining us for this week's installment in the We Believe series. Greetings again, friends. I'm Paul Thompson from Huntersville United Methodist Church, joined again today by my good friend and colleague Steve Autry from Denver United Methodist Church and introducing someone new to some of you. This is Rod Arters, who we call uh, our Director of Youth Ministries, but is so much more than that in the life of our church. Rod is going to be preaching at Huntersville this week, so we're inviting him into the conversation this week as we take on this next phrase in the Apostles' Creed that is follows the born of the Virgin Mary. We say, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. So I want to turn to Steve and Rod and initiate the conversation. When we say, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Steve, what is it that we're saying and how did this man's name get included in our creed? <laughs> That's a good question. I, but before I get to that, I want to ask Rod how his back's doing. <laughs> My He's carried a lot of load. <laughs> <laughs> You're having to carry this guy and I appreciate that. Uh, also, it's just good to see everybody again. And in case you're wondering where we are and you're part of Denver United Methodist Church, we had a work crew come in to the Arbor building a backdrop for outdoor worship. So we greatly appreciate that. Uh, and I do, Rod, appreciate you carrying my friend Paul. He needs all the help he can get, as you know. Absolutely. And, uh, but it is interesting that um, one writer said we would never have remembered who this guy was, speaking of Pilate if he weren't part of Jesus' story. And, uh, and it is fascinating to me that the creed, outside of the Holy Trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we only get two names in the creed. We get Mary, which we get, right? Mary, nobody would argue Mary doesn't belong. But then you get Pilate. You don't get James or John or even Paul or no, Peter. No, Peter, anybody else. You get the bad guy. Uh, and uh, Rod, what what makes you? What do you think of that? Well, I, I think it's always interesting the shout outs that the scriptures give, or, or the founding fathers of the early church fathers give to uh, certain individuals or certain people. Um, you're right. When you look at history, Pilate is very much unknown outside of the gospel accounts. Uh, I found it interesting that in 1961 they found what they called the Pilate Stone. It was a it's actually a piece of um, uh, limestone that had an inscription on it to Pontius Pilate and that was kind of what showed the rest of the world that this guy actually existed because outside of the Gospels they wouldn't have known that. So, right. um, but I think it is uh, an interesting piece of history that he's placed in those creeds for that time. Yeah, this guy who in, in terms of the broad Roman Empire, he, he would have been serving in a backwoods place that would not have been very visible, would not have been more very important to the rest of the empire so from that standpoint he, he's serving a backwoods place yes. he's not a star he, he could not have been high up on the emperor's uh oh i know you list to yeah. get sent I mean, you can't get much further away from rome than to go to the middle east uh, at the time i mean that he was on the the border of the empire so he was a he's a nobody by roman accounts even though he was the governor and that also meant, though, while he was a nobody in some ways, because he was a governor, he represented something. He represents uh, the power of the Roman Empire, the power of the empire to be in control, the power of the empire to exert their will upon the population. Uh, and he was, uh, well, he would have been despised by the Jews that he lorded over. It's always so interesting to me to think about power and how someone like Pontius Pilate held that power over Jesus. And we say in the creed, we say suffered under Pontius Pilate. That, that word really has strength and, and really resonates. He, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Well, and the suffering, obviously, it, was in the, it took many forms, really. It took in the form of, of mocking him. We know that he was spit upon. We know that he was beaten. We know that he was flogged. And even though Pontius Pilate didn't uh, do any of those things individually or by himself, his leadership was the one that put his stamp of approval mm -hmm. on all those behaviors, which is why he's the fall guy for that. Yeah. 
But he also, he did have the power to mm-hmm. not pass judgment. I mean, he, he passed judgment. He could have said back to the le- religious leaders of the day who brought the Sanhedrin, who brought the charges against Jesus, get out of my, get out of my face. This is a, I, no, you don't, but he, he became a, um, he became the the person who was ultimately responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. It doesn't go forward without mm-hmm. his because he could have stopped. He it, could have stopped it, or he could have insisted they do it. Right. If if you're familiar with that story in the scriptures, his wife has a dream and says, "You really shouldn't be involved with this guy," and yet Pilate continues and. It's, because of being afraid, I think. And a political calculation. A political calculation. And and that's important to remember, I think, that there was a political calculus behind this that Pilate's thinking, you know, it Passover, Jerusalem, the population of Jerusalem swells at Passover. And they're there to celebrate um, this remembrance of the Jews overthrowing the Egyptian empire. So they're aware that this is a tense time. And Pilate's thinking, let's just get through this weekend. Let's just get through this event so I can go back, because he didn't live in Jerusalem. He would have been over at Caesarea by the sea where he marched his troops into Jerusalem for Passover. He wants to get back to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, oh, just... Just get us, get this done. What will cause, you know, so it's a political calculation. Okay, I need to appease these people to keep them from whatever they're going to do from revolting, and I need to get this guy Jesus out of the way. And ultimately, the, the charges that Jesus is crucified upon is, I guess, could be basically sedition, mm-hmm. right? claiming mm-hmm. kingship. Yeah. And, and for Romans to say anybody other than Caesar is our king or our supreme leader, is that's treason. That's treason. And so then we come to the second one part and we come something that is so central to the Christian faith something that each and every one of us I think when we wear a cross when we see a cross uh, as I look at uh, Denver United Methodist Church the cross is prominently displayed it, it's so ironic that this is the main visual symbol of our church this cross upon which Jesus was crucified well on the crucifixion as you know uh, for the Jews, it was the most disgraceful form of punishment that there could be. And for the Romans, on their side of it, it was the most inhumane form of punishment. And so they, it comes together in the most inhumane and the most uh, humiliating uh, form of torture, form of execution, all in one in yes. one spot. It's the ultimate expression of power mm. by the Romans. And their main primary tool to keep people in line was, if you cross us, this is what will happen yeah. to you. It was the guillotine of their day. It yes. was the, the news, um, the electric, yeah, the chair. News, electric, electric chair. chair. The, uh, the but it was more than that because of the way it was to when Rome when the Romans crucified something. What's interesting about Jesus' crucifixion is that it's actually pretty short lived. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people would remain on the cross on crosses for days before they died, and ultimately they also didn't take people down usually. It's partly the Passover that they're, they take Jesus down. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's just a, the ultimate degradation and the ultimate power move by, mm-hmm. by Pilate, by the Roman Empire, which is interesting. It's like, I think it's, it's a very interesting thing that God, and that's something we have to remember, is that Jesus is fully God, mm-hmm. gives up his very life to... Um, combat the power of empire and oppression um, in that moment. I think it's interesting is that obviously with God Almighty, Jesus is of uh, his exact rep- representation, mm-hmm. but the power differential in that, um, Jesus at any moment could have gotten off the cross. Yep. He even says to Pilate, you would have no authority had it not been given to yep. you. And we have what uh, one theologian called a mid-level bureaucrat holding the authority over Jesus. The power differential is just striking mm-hmm. it is. that although Pilate was the most powerful figure maybe in that narrative or in that scene, his power was far, far less than what Christ brought to the table and he laid it down. Well, and, and as Paul said, it, it, it shows up primarily, you see Pilate in Matthew and John. Mm-hmm. 
And in Matthew's gospel, so much of the leading up to Jesus is talking about this great inversion. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. And he's basically saying, you all, meaning us, humanity, you have no idea what real power is. We often think of power in terms of, um, of all, well, when I say power, what do you think? Let's just start there. Well, physical strength, right. military might. I mean, economic, economic. wealth. Um, and we think of power in those terms. And yet Jesus um, shuns all those forms of power because they're ultimately false. I mean, and, and, and takes the worst that w could possibly be given and uh, says, you know, almost like, doesn't, you know, in, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus doesn't even speak up for himself. Mm -hmm. And Pilate's like, what? Why, why won't you even defend yourself? Which leads us to a little bit of conversation when we say was crucified dead. It, it, it's so critical, I think, that we acknowledge that through the years, there, there's been a lot of discussion about was Jesus really dead? Was it, uh, did he appear to be dead? Uh, many of the, the Jewish uh, people would have, would have questioned that aspect of it. Was he really dead or did he just appear to be dead? And, and I think when we affirm in the Christian faith and in the Apostles' Creed, Jesus was, was truly <laughs> yeah. dead. We the answer have to, to that is that. yes. <laughs> yes, the answer right. to that is dead. And, and what does that mean for us? And, and why did Jesus have to die, I think, is a question that often comes to the minds of, uh, of, of people in, in churches and everywhere. What was the purpose? What was the meaning of Jesus dying? Well, yeah. You look at it from in the in the context of, of the I call it the verse, but in, in the phrase in the um, Apostles' Creed. But it ultimately is going to end up in a resurrection mm -hmm. as we as we right. move forward. But you can't resurrect something that's not right. buried. And, and, it, and there's a difference between resurrection and resuscitation. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. You have to be dead. And and for one thing, the Romans were good at killing people. They knew how to kill people, yeah, and well Jesus burst. would yeah. not have come off that cross if he was not yeah. dead. Yeah. Well, they made sure of it. I mean, they absolutely made sure that he was dead. And so the death of Jesus becomes the, the, the act upon which everything else depends. Again, you can't have a resurrection until we have death. And then his burial follows. Right. Jesus was crucified dead and buried. There's so much intrigue around this this idea of burial and, and the way the creed proceeds through that is like crucified dead buried mm -hmm. it is boom 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 it, it and drives home pun intended i guess the the point that this was a this happened and by putting the name pilot with it it connects it to a point in time in human history mm -hmm. that is verifiable that says, yes, this did happen, and it happened in this way, suffered, crucified, dead, buried. And so many times we want to rush past that. This is a kind of gets us to the last week at, over here at Denver we talked about um, we did a little Christmas stuff, right, and people were a little confused, but <laughs> we did the, the Mary story. And, uh, but this gets us to Good Friday. And how many of us want to live either in a, a Christmas story or the glory of Easter Sunday because, well, it's, those are good places to be, but we can't ignore the, the pain that is in this, the suffering, the hurt, the loss, the brokenness. That, the, the bleeding, right. the, the, the hurt. Yeah, when Jesus says in John, he says, uh, I uh, laid down my life for my right. friends. Mm -hmm. it, it is a, a, a very uh, purposeful act. Jesus dies in order to accomplish so much of what we believe is part of the Christian faith. He lays down his life so that we may have life. And, and it's something that the church has been pondering since this happened. It, and there are, um, like the big fancy word for this is atonement. And there are a lot of what are called atonement theories out there about why Jesus had to die, what did God hope to accomplish, what did God accomplish in Jesus' death. And, and you can you know, take a few moments to search those. If you just search atonement theories, you're going to find at least seven or eight that are within the main thought of historic Christianity. Uh, and it's one of those things that, that we often talk can get caught up in, but um, I'm going to 
quote one of my favorite modern theologians, Dallas Willard, who said, whatever, whatever arrangement God comes to in the death of Jesus, we can debate that, we can discuss that, but what we can count on is that it was good for God and good for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Rod, final thoughts that you have that you'd like to share as we suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Where do we, where do we go with this? You know, I can't help but think we live in a culture today where people want to rewrite history. We, we have things like the Holocaust that happened, and we want to say it didn't happen. And I love how the Bible doesn't shy away from the hard, ugly truths that there was a suffering, there was a crucifixion, there was a death, there was a burial. And the burial was long enough by Jewish standards, he was dead, it was not coming back. And that was important too as part of the resurrection story. And I, and I, I know a lot of times we, we talk about crucifixion and we talk about the physical part of it, but the reality was it wasn't the physical part that was the, the issue, it was the emotional, the mm-hmm. spiritual separation that was created. And that's the whole point of it. It's yeah. not just a physical thing it's a spiritual thing and right. if we don't get the spiritual aspect of this we've just missed the we've missed the whole thing well and, and the agony in that because i believe it's tim keller who writes or teaches about that um and i'm sure several other people have too that if we think of god as father son and holy spirit as we do mm-hmm. in creation from the beginning that in this moment it's the the time that that community is broken that, that God doesn't exist as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in that moment that Jesus suffers his death. And that's agony to have that relationship broken. It's agony for Christ, and it's agony for God as Father and as Holy Spirit. And that it opens, it breaks, it, I guess in a sense, it breaks the Trinity. And in, in that Psalm 22, Jesus quotes, Psalm 22, verse 1, on the cross, Jesus quotes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of Scripture on the heart and mind and lips of Jesus, even as that relationship, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yep. So I hope that uh, this conversation today has shed some light, has helped you think more about what is it we're saying when we say suffering under Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. It is heart and core of our faith. This is, uh, this is critical to us that we both understand what has happened and the implications of what happened. But then our story takes a whole new uh, turn next week. It, it will. And that crucified, dead, buried, those are all uh, images of finality, of this is the end. This is a no more, right? And so many times I've work with people and even my, my even my own <clears throat> life have had those moments where i'm thinking where do we go from here there, i don't see a future right it, this is crucified dead and buried is putting a big fat period behind the end of the story and and so many times i've, I've dealt with people who think they don't have a future mm-hmm. because they feel like they're they're dead not I mean while not physically dead they don't see a future at all and yet here we get to this point in the story where it appears there's a big fat period that says, boom, the world has spoken, the world is, the powers that be have passed judgment, and this is the end of the story. But the good news is uh, we'll continue on with the, the rest of the story, if I can as, quote Paul Harvey yeah, again. And as Tony Campolo once said, you know, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Right. Let's close together our time in a, in a prayer. <clears throat> We ponder this mystery, O God, in which both you come to earth in the person of your son Jesus, taking on the flesh of humanity, and then offering that, huma- offering that flesh on a cross to suffer, to bleed, to die, to be buried where all seemed hopeless and lost. Only keep us, O Lord God, hopeful that death cannot, will not, shall not have the final word when, when you speak. As we <clears throat> think about what does it mean for your son to die, let us also be hopeful and mindful that we will find a, a, a new word to say. You will speak that word of resurrection. Speak that word to us again this day in the strong name, the holy name 
the crucified name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.